Thank you very much, Linda, for this uh, very interesting lecture, in looking into our own future. The last uh, speaker of this uh, session will be Lydia Lynch, and she will be talking to us about the future of immunology, and she's really from here, Dublin. So thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to take part in this amazing event in my hometown. Um, also thanks for trusting me to talk about this very um, important topic. I am scared, but I am honored. Um, and so I'm going to do as Mike Murphy suggested and talk about something outside of my comfort zone. So I'm not going to talk about my own research until the very end. And I'm not going to talk about the typical job of the immune system in infection that we're all very comfortable with. I'm going to talk about a less appreciated but still very major role of the immune system um, because I think it holds huge promise for much needed medicines in many hard to treat diseases. And so because of Schrodinger, the theme of my talk today will be entropy. Um, if, like me, you don't think much about entropy until today maybe, um, that's okay, don't worry. I am going to take the great Dan Dennett's advice and oversimplify it. Um, so entropy is a measure of disorder. It's complex, and we don't have to fully understand it to appreciate that the main role for the immune system is actually to fight against entropy in our body, or to fight against disorder. But first, let me start with the original understanding of the immune system that we're all very comfortable with, and that it's there to protect us um, from when outside foreign, dangerous pathogens attack us, like bacteria, viruses, and fungus. Um, the immune system is why we're sitting here today and not living in a bubble, like um, this boy, David Vedder, who was born without an immune system and unfortunately lived his life in a bubble until he died aged 12 of an infection. Um, and so because infection and outside danger are um, entering our bodies causes massive disorder, our immune system is the professionals built to deal with this. And of course, vaccination is also hugely important. Um, I'm not going to discuss vaccination here today because um, it's, it, I, it, I could talk all day for it. So even though it's a major feature of the future of immunology, um, because vaccines will get better and we'll have vaccines against more diseases like HIV, and vaccination has saved millions of lives. So to protect our children, to protect our community, and to protect our world, we should vaccinate. However, for a long time, this was thought to be the extent of the immune system. Um, protection from outside harmful things, things that can cause disease. But what about danger and disorder that start inside our body? And so what I want to focus on today is entropy that Schrodinger talked about in the first chapter of his book, What is Life? Um, because what I'm really talking about is order. Keep in order, prevent in disorder. And entropy is a measure of disorder. And with time, because the pull of entropy, disorder always increases. Everything decays if left alone. Think of how weeds overtake the garden, cars rust, and as we just heard from Dame Linda Partridge, people get old. Um, and Schrodinger talked about order and disorder and how living systems defied um, entropy. And he was talking about thermodynamics. And when Emma Teeling read that book, she taught it to mean um, order in the genome. But what I think he was talking about, or what it means to me, is immunology. Because it's actually our immune system that's constantly fighting against the pull of entropy in our body, surveying and protecting from disorder and keeping order all the time. And so the immune system is key to our body's homeostasis, um, which essentially means keeping order. And homeostasis is critical for wellness that we heard about yesterday from Leroy Hood. And the immune system, therefore, is essential for wellness. Um, and because it's commonly taught that the immune system is just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for a bug to breach our barriers, but this is not the case at all. Um, we sometimes don't realize that there's constant repair um, and damage going on in our bodies all the time. And because the, the, the universe naturally slides towards disorder, you have to use energy to create stability and order. And so just like successful houses and cars require um, cleaning and maintenance, and successful relationships require care and maintenance. The successful maintenance of our body requires the constant efforts of the immune system all the time. 
So just think of the gut for an example. Now, you don't have to look at any of the details in this picture to see that there's a lot going on in the gut all the time, and it's actually the case in all our organs. Um, and so every single day, the cells of the villi um, shed and new ones are made by the crypt, by the cells in the stem cells in the crypts. And they do this in response to the diet that we eat. So the more we eat and the different things we eat, they make, the, these stem cells make different, um, different amounts of daughter cells. And this balance needs to be perfect throughout the whole gut, throughout our whole life, or else we'll get cancer. Um, and at the same time, at, at the same time that this is happening, we also, our gut is completely full of bugs, mainly good bugs, and we must live in harmony with these, so the immune system mustn't sense these. And these also change with the diet every day. And then at the same time, the food, we're taking in food all the time. Food is foreign, it's coming from outside, um, and we must not attack the food. Um, well, at the same time, while we're eating, we could eat a bad bug, and the immune system absolutely has to sense that. And so, if any of these things goes wrong, we could end up with a disease like inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, different food allergies, celiac disease, and colorectal cancer. But our amazing immune system is at work all the time to prevent this. And so, how does it do it? A big part of how it does this is inflammation. And inflammation has got a bad reputation as being something that's nasty, but homeostatic inflammation is the protective response that our immune system uses to keep us safe. The immune system detects disorder and mounts an immune response, and the immune cells produce cytokines. These are key. These are the effector molecules of the immune system. And then everything should, the, the, these are going to put the um, disorder back into order, and then everything should be shut off with a very fine balance, because once this disorder is detected, the inflammatory response must be turned off. And often this goes wrong, and you get chronic inflammation, and then this is uh, underlying many different diseases, nearly all diseases, and so potentially the immune system is involved in nearly all diseases. Because what is a disease? Um, in a basic sense, a disease is a disorder of some part of the body. And if the immune system's main job is to seek out disorder, um, we could predict that the immune system is then involved in all disease. And there's no part of our body that's separate, really, to the immune system. We used to think the brain was, but I'll tell you later, um, it's not. And so not only immu immunology <coughs> is key to the future of medicine for typical disorders that we already knew had an immune component, like autoimmune diseases and like rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes, but also it seems to be key to many diseases that we didn't know had an immune component, like diseases associated with the brain and type 2 diabetes. And it also seems to play a key role in things that are not diseases at all, things that are just regular maintenance of our body, um, things that are very important to us, like for successful running of our body, like how we deal with food, how we store it. How, surprisingly, which I'll tell you at the end, the protection from cold. And if we can accept that the immune system is involved in all of these, then it opens up a world of possibility for new ways that we might treat these diseases. And I only have time to talk about three, so I'm going to talk about cancer, I'm going to talk about diseases associated with the brain and the immune system associated with fat. And so let's start with a feel-good success story, um, which is cancer immunotherapy. So I think this is one of the most exciting breakthroughs in immunology that's already benefited loads of patients um, in the clinic, and it's just going to get better over the next 10 years. And cancer is a classic example of when disorder wins. Entropy increases over time, as does cancer, because the more we live, the more chance that something is going to go wrong. And I became interested in immunology because of cancer, because we have this killing, uh, innate killing system already in our body that can kill cancer, which I just thought was so cool. And here, here in this uh, video is a natural killer cell of the immune system, and this is the tumor, and it's really a professional at killing, finding tumor cells and killing them. So then, why do we die of cancer? So what do we know about the immune, how the immune system would sense disorder, including cancer? Well, cancer happens when a normal cell goes out of control, dividing. And these cells that are dividing like mad, 
express stress signals on their, on their surface. Um, and they also produce antigens that normal cells don't produce because they're divided normally. And the immune cells are able to detect these stress markers, um, markers of disorder, and they become activated, and then they can kill. This is this positive activation signals. But then what was later discovered is that the immune system um, also has, and immune cells also have inhibitory receptors. And these inhibitory receptors like PD-1 and CTLA-4, these are the brakes of the immune system. They're absolutely critical to prevent autoimmunity so our immune system doesn't attack our own body. Um, and these are called checkpoints. But cancer hijacks this system. And the cancer cell put receptors for these inhibitory receptors on them. And so the immune cells that come into the tumor to kill it are inhibited by the tumor um, because it's hijacked this system. And it was these five scientists, Arlene Sharp, Gordon Freeman, Tasuko Hanjo, Li Peng Chang, and James Allison, sorry, it's gone a bit wonky, that discovered this, um, discovered this inhibitory pathway in the immune system. And they're potentially Nobel Prize winners of the future for this um, major discovery. And they were studying something else. They were studying autoimmunity and HIV. They weren't even studying cancer. But they found that um, cancer hijacked this pathway and it prevented the tumor cells from killing. And when they designed antibodies to block CTLA-4 or to block PD-1, the immune cells became reinvigorated and woke up and eradicated the tumor. And this is just a little aside story. When I moved to Boston um, 10 years ago as a postdoc, I was working in the same floor in Harvard as Arlene Sharp. And I met Arlene on my first week back after having my third baby. And we were having a cup of tea, and Arlene was giving me advice on returning to work after having a child and what she did after returning to work after having a child. And in the room beside us, she was also discovering PD-1 and PD-L1. And these were being tried in the clinic, and they were working in people. And it was just the most exciting time to be a young immunologist. Um, and the elevators, this picture here, is the stickers in the, is the elevators to get into the lab and to get into the building were completely covered in these stickers. And my kids used to come into the lab every week and they knew these adverts and they knew all about PD-1 and they'd go into their school and tell their teacher how the immune system was curing cancer and all about PD-1. And these five scientists, I mean, they were rewriting history of cancer. And that what I think is the most remarkable thing about this is that they weren't cancer biologists. They weren't even studying cancer or the tumor. They were studying the immune system. And this antibody, ipilimumab, which blocks one of these, um, CTLA-4, um, this, one of these inhibitory pathways, has now been used to treat over 50,000 patients with melanoma and other cancers, including prostate, kidney, bladder, ovarian, and lung. The longest surviving patients patient treated with ipilimumab is still alive now 10 years after their first treatment and that person had end-stage melanoma that had metast <coughs> excuse me, metastasized to their lung and that person would have had little other chance of survival. And after a follow-up follow -up of 10,000 patients treated with ipilimumab, there's a long-term survival of over four years in 22% of cases. And this is compared to no patients in the control group that reached the four-year survival rate. And the really good news for us here in Ireland is yesterday, September 5th, ipilimumab was approved by the HSE for patients in Ireland with cancers, starting with lung cancer. And this is like huge progress forward for cancer immunotherapy in Ireland. Even more exciting than just CTLA-4 blocker on its own, if you block both checkpoints, if you block CTLA-4 and PD-1, you get 57% response rate in end stage, in, in late stage um, metastatic melanoma. And this is 57% of patients potentially cured that had no cure before, nothing else had worked. And th this is actually now, we're using the most taboo word in oncology, which is cure, and it's because of the immune system. Now, is all cancer cured? No, unfortunately not. Um, quickly after this discovery, we then learned that the tumor actually has many layers of suppression of the immune system. It's not just PD-1 and it's not just CTLA-4, but they have many other ones. And so I think the future of the field is going to be different combinations of these for patients. But so far, um, some trials with different combina combinations seem to be... The combinations seem to be chosen kind of at random and some of them are not working. And so the future of the field is likely that we would have a more targeted personalized combinations depending on what the person's tumor looked like. 
And just last Sunday, Tsuko Hanjo, that discovered PD-1, he was speaking at the European Congress of Immunology, um, and he predicted that cancer immunotherapy will become the dominant anti-cancer therapy within a few decades as translational immunologists learn how to increase its potency. And he also predicted that all cancers may be able to be treated by cancer immunotherapy in the future. And so maybe we're not at the top of that mountain yet, that they said in the Dana-Farber, but maybe we can see the top. Um, and as James Allison said, we're not trying to harness the immune system, we're trying to unleash it. And when this, uh, you know, this, if this works, it's going to lead to more and more patients being able to be cured, and cancer becomes more and more treatable through targeting the immune system. So this is a great success story, but it's not completely surprising that the immune system is involved in cancer. Um, what is a surprise, or what was a surprise in the field, is how the immune system is involved in so many other diseases that we had no idea had an immune component, and that's because of inflammation. And I mentioned that inflammation is actually a protective defense pathway to detect disorder, which then becomes uncontrolled and then becomes part of the disease that it's trying to protect in the first place. And on the left, we already knew that these were all inflammatory diseases that had an immune component, and actually these are all on the rise now. Um, but on the right is diseases that we hadn't actually appreciated had an inflammatory component. Who would have thought that the immune system is involved in heart disease, stroke, obesity, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's disease? And now, as we discussed, if the immune system's role is really to detect and survey for disorder, then maybe it's not surprising that it's involved in everything. But this idea is not as well appreciated yet, and we're still at the very beginning of understanding this. But if we can understand this, it's going to provide a huge opportunity for much-needed medicines to treat these diseases. So now let's talk about the brain and the fat. So I say it's a secret immune system, um, it's not really a secret, but we had no idea it was there until a few years ago. And actually, we only found out when disorder showed up. Um, but this led to the realization that the immune system in the brain and fat are critical for keeping homeostasis and preventing disorder all the time. And so the brain is maybe the unlikeliest place to find the immune system, because for years, textbooks have shown that the, the brain and the immune system exist in isolation from each other. The brain controls the body, the immune system defends it, and, that's it, and they're separate to each other. But then who's keeping order in the brain? And at this conference, we've heard already about the amazing neurons. We're going to hear more later today in the brain. But there's also microglia in the brain, and they're a macrophage-like um, cell here in green. And um, they, uh, a macrophage is a type of immune cell that's found throughout, throughout the body. These microglia live in the brain. And they're always working, they're always wiggling, they're always like, they're, they're actually the only cell in the brain that's always moving. And they're looking for trouble all the time, looking for signs of trouble, surveying the brain for danger, for bacteria, viruses, and injury. And recently they've been studied as the bad guys in Alzheimer's disease. Because in Alzheimer's, there's this huge buildup of sticky clumps of beta amyloid protein that forms plaque, and this disorder is sensed by the microglia in the brain, and so the immune system or the immune response kicks in. And you can see here in red, this is the beta amyloid plaque here, and this is the microglia all come onto it to gobble all the, the mess up. Um, and this is basically an inflammatory response. It's trying to heal the brain by clearing away the amyloid plaque, but for some reason it fails, and the inflammation response gets, an inflammatory response gets out of order itself, and it makes everything worse, and so the brain cells are struggling to survive. The current medication for Alzheimer's disease is approved maybe because it's just better than nothing. The drugs were pioneered in the 70s and 80s, and they treat the symptoms as opposed to the underlying biology. And so more research into exactly what's going on in the immune system um, in the brain gives very exciting possibilities for future therapy targeting the immune system. And from <coughs> seeing this inflammation in, in Alzheimer's, neuroscientists just re recently discovered another major breakthrough, that the immune system and the brain are in constant communication, which was not believed before because of the blood-brain barrier, which is like the Berlin Wall, you, you can't get past it. And however, the blood-brain barrier is much less impenetrable than we assumed before. 
Now, the immune cells themselves are not getting through, only if there's something wrong. But in the meninges of the brain is packed with immune cells. And this is the brain here, this is the skull, the meninges here where the cerebral spinal fluid is, has, is full of immune cells. And all these immune cells also produce cytokines. And the cytokines can get in through the brain barrier into the brain. And when they do, they can instruct the neurons in how to behave, and they can instruct the microglia. And actually, it was recently found when um, a group in California removed these um, T cells from the meninges, Alzheimer's got much worse. It was twofold worse. It was twofold more buildup of plaque. And that's because the, well, what they propose is that these cells are producing antibodies and cytokines that aid the microglia in mopping up the, the plaque. And without them, you don't get a, as good a job. So the immune system inside and outside the brain and the fluid are collaborating um, to, to both look for order and um, look for disorder and restore order. And then another major discovery that just happened about the communication between the brain and the immune system is the discovery of lymphatic system. So it's not just Alzheimer's where the brain accumulates waste like beta amyloid. The brain is producing a lot of waste all the time, and it needs to be removed. Um, and it's thought that the, 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 you need to be removed to keep healthy, and it's thought that this happens when we sleep, but how this gets out of the brain wasn't really fully understood, and this was a major question, major fundamental question in science. And Jonathan Kipnis and his team at the University of Virginia have found that the lymph there's lymphatic vessels in the, in, the, in the brain. And lymphatic vessels, they're much like uh, arteries and veins, except they carry immune cells and lymph and waste. Um, and usually when you look at the picture of the lymphatic system, it only goes up as far as your tonsils. Um, but now we know it drains the brain, and it's actually critical to remove waste from the brain at all, you know, all the time. And it could suggest also that glitches in this system may be happening in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, or maybe we might be able to enhance this system. Sorry, this is the lymphatics in the brain. We might be able to enhance this system for um, treatment of Alzheimer's or, or Parkinson's or also MS. Um, current treatments for MS um, suppress the immune system, which obviously makes sense because the immune system is attacking myelin sheets, but we may also need to have a properly functioning immune system in the meninges um, which, so re keeping this balance may be difficult. And then finally, who would have thought that the immune system could be involved in depression? So it seems to be. Um, depression is also difficult, is, is often difficult to treat, maybe because we don't fully know the, the cause, and mainly it's treated by interfering with the dopamine pathway, which with the presumption that dopamine is too low in everybody that has depression. Um, but mostly they don't measure this in anybody that's actually diagnosed with depression. And this book by um, Professor Ed Edward Bulmore um, proposes with evidence that inflammation in the brain may underlie um, the disease in some people with depression. And he also has found that TNF, one of these inflammatory cytokines, is increased in people with depression, and blocking this makes some, some people with depression feel better. And so he suggests some cases of depression may well have resulted from past infections or other inflammation-causing disorders where the inflammation didn't cle clear, and it became chronic. And now we know that the inflammatory cytokines that happened in this response can get into the, to the brain, and so p potentially they're, they're causing havoc there. And when I read this, it made me think about mild traumatic brain injury, um, which, which is a newly appreciated major cause of later um, depression and other psychiatric disorders later in life. And we know that the immune system has an important role in healing the brain after a mild traumatic brain injury. What in some people, if this inflammatory response doesn't end, is this going to um, lead to a uh, mental disorder later in life? Also, think of all them soldiers returning from war with all this um, damage that has happened to them. Potentially, some people's inflammation will not have um, cleared, and it could mean um, psychiatric disorders for them later through, through the inflammatory pathway. And so I think these studies illustrate the breadth of the immune system's response. Injury or proteins build up in the brain, and it's not foreign or a pathogen or a bug or cancer. It's something we obviously can still harm us, and our immune system is protecting us when we didn't even know it was. And we've just found this out. What else could the immune system be doing in and around the brain that we don't yet know about? 
And then the third and final story I'll tell you about is fat from my own research. Um, and just like our surprise that the immune system was involved in the brain, we find fat, another unlikely place, also has an immune system. And fat is all over our body. In obese people, it can account for 50% of the body mass, but even in lean people, it's all over our body, it's all under our skin, it's around our organs. And all of this immune system, all of this fat, has its own unique immune system. And why would we need an immune system in fat? Because we don't get much cancer in fat or an infection in fat, so what is it actually doing there? And once again, we found out that fat had an immune system when a disorder showed up, when something went wrong, and that's obesity. And obesity causes massive disorder to the whole body, but especially to the fat. So as we eat and our, our fat tries to deal with this excess energy from the diet, the fat cells expand and expand until they eventually burst. And they released all this lipids and, and apoptotic debris and our immune system to sense this disorder and it comes in and gobbles it all up. And then just like in Alzheimer's, this inflammatory response doesn't turn off. And just like in Alzheimer's, it makes the disease worse. It actually contributes to insulin resistance and to our development of diabetes. And from our obesity studies, again, just like Alzheimer's and, the, and, the, and then the normal brain, we also learned that from our obesity studies that normal, healthy, lean people, um, their fat also has an immune system that's constantly fighting disorder in order to maintain homeostasis. And initially, we thought fat was inert, it was just sitting there storing stuff. But now we know it's actually very dynamic. It contracts when we go to bed, we're fasting. When we get up in the morning and eat breakfast, it expands. It also produces a lot of molecules that um, control the brain and our behavior. And therefore, the immune system must keep check on all this to make sure everything is optimally maintained. And a few years ago, we found that lean adipose tissue contains a lot of cells called INKT cells. And what's special about these cells is that they recognize lipids, unlike most cells in the immune system. This is the lipid-sensing arm of the immune system, which was thought to be rare in humans until we found them in fat. This is them here. You can see they live in between the adipocytes and also beside the macrophages. And they play an important role in maintaining order. We know this because in mice, if you remove them, the mouse gets fat, and it also gets diabetes. And I won't go into the details, but again, cytokines here produced by the INKT cells, this time anti-inflammatory cytokines, like IL-10, were key, because these are key to keeping the adipocyte healthy and also the macrophage healthy. And finally, a very quick story. These were not the only cells that we found in, in adipose tissue, and I'm going to tell you about the most unexpected finding we had about the immune system in fat. And it's not about pathogenesis at all. It's about there's no d disease involved at all. It's something that happens every day, but nevertheless potentially is dangerous to us, and that's changes in the environmental temperature. So we discovered these in eight T cells called gamma delta T cells. They also live in, fat in here between the adipocytes. They're also rare in the rest of the body. And what's special about these is they produce a cytokine called IL-17. So what happens when you remove these cells? Well, when we removed them from the fat, nothing happened. And we were very disappointed because it had taken us years to make this mouse, and we that's one reason. But the other reason was it was very unsatisfying that there was these special cells that lived in the fat. They never moved out of the fat. They were very rare in the rest of the body. They produce IL-17. And when you remove them, nothing really happened. So we said, OK, let's study these, mouse, these mice more, more deeply. And when we did, we found that they were a little bit colder than the other mice, just a little bit. And so we know um, that the fat is very important for keeping us warm. When we sense, uh, when, we're, when we're cold, we, our, our skin senses um, the cold through uh, cutaneous thermoreceptors. It goes to the hypothalamus. This activates the sympathetic nervous system to produce norepinephrine. And the target of this is the fat cell. So you need the fat cell to then induce lipolysis. The lipids get released, and the lipids are the, are the fuel for thermogenesis to burn, to burn these lipids so that we can keep warm. And this is very important for us to stay warm as well as shivering. And so now, what was very surprising is that when we put these mice into the normal mice into the cold, these gamma delta T cells started producing IL-17 immediately. So for some reason, these cells are activated by the cold. So what happens if we took away these cells and then put the mice into the cold? And what happened was they all died. So, <laughs> and this was sad. 
Um, but I was happy with just the first experiment. Um, and so what happens is when we, when we give a cold challenge, the mice um, drop their temperature. And then at this critical time, five hours, the mice induce lipolysis, and they use this fat to fuel the thermogenesis, and then they can ramp up their thermogenesis to stay alive. But the, when you don't have IL-17, it didn't happen. And I'm not going to go into the details now, but we, we looked into this further, and what we found is that these particular T cells appear in the fat in the fetus a couple of days before birth, while the other cells come later after you're born. So this suggests that you need them for when you're born, and babies, when they're born, they can't shiver, and so they need this, this thermogenesis that's happening in the adipose tissue, in the fat, to keep them warm. So really, who would have thought that the immune system was specifically designed for these innate T cells to be in the fat for when we're born to keep us warm? And so what we found basically from our study of immune system in the fat is that it's unique. It contains immune cells that are quite rare in other parts of the body, and there's different cells for different roles in homeostasis. Um, some sense changes in the diet and the fat cell, and others sense the cold. And so what I've tried to illustrate today um, is how the immune system, once taught to be just protecting us from infection throughout our whole life, now has a much broader role. Um, in, in our whole life, really, um, keeping us warm, shaping our personalities. I haven't talked about that, but that's neuroimmunology studies. Responding to our diet, protecting or causing obesity, attacking our own cells as well, um, causing a lot of autoimmune diseases, especially as we get old, and also protecting and con contributing to brain disorder. Obviously, modifying the immune system by enhancing it or inhibiting it or dampening it is not going to cure every disease. But what these this research in the last five years have revealed is that we can't ignore the immune system in any disease. What these new avenues also highlight is the need for more people to understand immunology. Who would have thought a psychiatrist or an oncologist or a neuroscientist or an endocrinologist needs to understand immunology? And in order for us immunologists to understand the full potential of the immune system, there's a huge need for collaboration with different fields, especially neuroscience. And mainly I hope that young people here listening to this can see how exciting your immune system is. Because with the, the, the new role for immunology in all of life, really, we're going to need new immunologists, we're going to need more immunologists with different skills and backgrounds. And there may be a chance that this field is going to provide cures for much needed uh, for medicines um, for much, um, for, <laughs> sorry, cures for some diseases. <laughs> so, Gurv Mahagut, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the funding, my lab. <laughs>